age, I started riding in the mountains with my with my grandfather, who was uh, working on the uh, JB Ranch as a range rider. All of my education came out of out of the Hat Creek Valley. There's I was taught uh, our, where our hunting grounds were at and um, what time of year to go for them, for deer, and what time of year to go looking for berries and to harvest harvest our food for the winter. Um, so the valley really means a lot to me. The meat is hard to find now because of all the logging that's happening. The deer are having to move out into other areas. Um, say, for example, um, we hunted for two, three weeks and never even saw saw deer, you know, see old tracks and that's about it. I mean, it takes that long now to get something. I don't, uh, I don't believe that the wildlife is going to come back the way it used to be, but I think we can, we can keep it at a level that, that the people in the area can, can continue to go out and hunt and to provide uh, the meat for their, for their families. Um, now the Hat Creek project goes ahead, and uh, I don't think that that um, it's going to do the game any good. It's going to go only make things worse. Um, the berries, the harvesting of different berries, uh, is going to get worse, and the, also the um, the hunting is for sure going to get get to a level where it's almost impossible to find something. You better listen to the voices from the mountain Trying to tell you what you just might need to know For the empire's days are numbered if you're counting And the people just get stronger blow by blow You better listen when they talk about strip mining Gonna turn the rolling hills to acid clay if you're preaching all about that silver lining, you'll be preaching till the hills are stripped away. You better listen to the cries of the dying miners. Better feel the pain of the children and the wives. We gotta stand and fight together for survival. And that's bound to mean a change in all our lives. What I saw in uh, Colts of Montana was was really, um, I didn't know how to accept it, but I couldn't believe, besides the machinery that they were using uh, to dig up the coal, because they, they removed so much soil at one time uh, with one scoop. It was just, I couldn't even imagine something like that happening. Trying to picture that in Hat Creek is, uh, for 35 years, you know, this continuously happening 24 hours a day for 35 years is, is um, it's really a frightening thing to think about. Uh, looking at the area, it, it coal strip uh, surrounding was really flat. There was no, hardly any mountains where miles and you had these two generating plants burning up all this coal and just shooting all of the um, pollution into the air. We visited the uh, University of Montana and we have contact down there, uh, Clancy Gordon. We uh, first worked on coal-fired power plants in, in an area back in West Virginia, Maryland, and we were working in that area on the impacts of acid rains upon the coniferous trees back there were grown on the, on the Christmas tree plantations. And these were primarily the pines and firs that were grown there for commercial use of selling for Christmas trees. This acid rain caused a very uh, slowness of growth, a ab abnormality of needles, and twisting of needles and this type of thing. Well, I would just expect that there's going to be much more damage in Hat Creek than there is going to be in Coal Strip. Number one, because of the high terrain. Number two, because of the lack of scrubbers that, you know, that, <coughs> that BC Hydro is proposing. You know, and Coal Strip has an ex exceptionally good uh, scrubbing system. It really removes a lot of the gaseous sulfur dioxide and, and removes a lot of the particulate. That's not true for BC Hydro. 
research has been, uh, they've been working on this for since about 1952 on the, uh, on the phenomenon of acid rain transport. Most of that work has been done in Europe during the 50s and 60s. And now in the 70s, American scientists as well as Canadian scientists are very concerned about the transport of acid rains. And they've got it down pretty close. They, they say somewhere between 800 to 1,000 miles is how far that uh, sulfur dioxide can be transported and converted before it is actually leached and washed out of the atmosphere. BC Hydro is not proposing something that will take to remove the gases. So that sulfur dioxide gas will come out in many hundreds of tons a day at that size of plant. And, uh, and that's a, one of the more toxic gases to vegetation. It's also toxic to human beings at, at high concentrations. At this mine, we mine one seam of coal. It's called the Rosebud Seam. It averages about 23 feet in thickness. It's a medium-grade sub-bituminous coal. Averages about 8,600 BTUs, a warranted sulfur content of 0.8%. It's not the best coal in the world as far as heat out or energy output, but it is a very clean coal. These are two of our coal haulers. They're Euclid 120s. They carry 120 ton of coal in belly dump. We have 14 haulers. Our shop building. We're expanding this as the mine grows. That stockpile right now is about half full. When it's full, it will hold 95,000 tons of coal. It's divided into three zones with five feeders per zone to this underground conveyor. It's a weighing conveyor on an integrated grizzly system, and we'll convey the coal up to the uh, top of the loadout. There's an automatic sampler. We sample each train as it goes out. So a train is constantly moving as it goes underneath. It never stops. We can load out at the rate of 4,000 tons per hour, or we can load a 10,000 ton train in two and a half hours. We average, when we get the cars from BN, we average four train loads per day. We have been able to get as many as eight, what that amounts to is we can rotate that pile every 48 hours. Okay, so we've never had a fire. Uh, there's never been any spontaneous combustion or explosion. We work the pile with cats and keep it fed constantly into the uh, conveying system. <laughs> When they, when they originally go in, they say there'll be no, no problem whatsoever. But <clears throat> the pro when the problem starts, what can the rancher really do about it? He, the basic thing, he can either fight the industry or sell out. And ba in, in general, it's easier for the, for the rancher farmer to sell out and just rather than fight through the courts the pollution problems that is, are being caused by that industry. So that's a tip of a problem in many, many areas where I have worked, where the damage occurs, and therefore the company comes in and buys the property. And they acquire more and more property, and therefore they have more and more to pollute. They're allowed to pollute more and more areas. That's actually their own property right now. But it's a, it's a, a serious situation, because it takes more and more agricultural lands out of production. And that's why we feel rather strongly about you know the siting of, of power plants, aluminum plants, and so on, or large polluting sources in agriculture areas. They just simply shouldn't be there because after all, you know, agriculture is the backbone of all strong countries. And without the agriculture, you have nothing. It's very hard to reclaim land, especially in an arid region such as the Coal Strip area. This is similar to uh, the, uh, the arid region around uh, the Hat Creek area where they plan on putting it. The area around Hat Creek and Coal Strip are very, very similar as far as rainfall, as far as vegetation is concerned. In fact, most of the same species grow in both places. One of the more interesting aspects of the studies that have occurred out there on that reclamation land is they have put cattle back out on some of that land as well as put the same uh, weight cattle, same age cattle, and so on, as well as putting them on the old uh, native vegetation over there. And, they, and the animals actually gain less weight on that reclaimed land than they did out there on the native vegetation, which we found to be rather surprising. From the past experience here, what would you say that we're looking toward? Like, uh, as Indian people, what are we, we going to be faced with? 
as far as um, the construction of uh, any large-scale construction, power plants, dams, uh, uh, roads, I think uh, most of the people that are operators, pipe fitters, welders, and stuff are brought in from the outside. Uh, I don't mean outside of the country, but outside of the area. And uh, they're there to uh, do a job and make money, and they move on. Uh, they don't really um, care too much or respect uh, the Indian tradition, culture, and cultural values. You probably um, should prepare yourself to um, uh, deal with some of the impacts that I mentioned, uh, 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 large, larger um, amount of students in your school, uh, more uh, demand for your uh, hospital and medical services, uh, your um, uh, community uh, events, affairs are going to be uh, uh, impacted by um, outsiders wanting to, uh, to attend your powwows, rodeos, whatever, and also I think you know, just generally, uh, uh, there's going to be um, uh, probably uh, more crime, more uh, drugs, more uh, uh, everything. This, it's just going to be increased uh, quite a bit. There's no compromise with coal companies. You might as well face up to that. You compromise with a coal company, and you might as well get rid of your reservation. They're going to get that coal as cheap as they can possibly get it, and they're going to give you the smallest piece of land. The government is going to give you as few privileges, as few as they can give, because you're a problem. What are we going to do about the Indian problem? What the hell are we going to do about it? Well, they want to get rid of them. You know, they don't want to burn us in ovens like they did the Jews. They don't want to kill us like they did in the 1850s. So they have found a sophisticated way, take our resources. It took millions of years to put the coal in the ground and to develop that ecosystem that you have there. And when you rip it out of the ground in one year or two years or 10 years, then you're wiping out millions of years of history. And then what's going to take place from there on, nobody knows. I always imagine a lot of times that, that there, there is going to be a lot of four-lane traffic, a lot of, a lot of planes, a lot of noise in the area after after this Hat Creek coal comes in, because they say it's going to be one of the biggest in the world. If the if the river the rivers are polluted and the watersheds are polluted, and then then all bands or all not only Indian bands, not only Indian people, but uh, the people that use use the benefits of the rivers downstream from here would be affected too, because of the pollution that this plant would would put out you know because everything all the the streams run down river and it probably go as far as the delta down vancouver you can grow almost anything here is if you can apply water to it and uh, you get a long seasonal summer and I, I just got no reason to move anywhere else. Would you move for BC Hydro? No. No, BC Hydro would pretty well have to pick me up and move me, but I'll be back. It's frightening to me. It's so difficult to compensate for large areas of land. Um, you know, how do they compensate for it? Uh, there just isn't that much land that's... Uh, Similar to this, it's rather unique, this, this whole area here. The uh, more heat units probably than anywhere else in Canada. We can grow um, things that just can't be grown in many other places with the exception of the southern states. And, um, you know, there's a great future for this country agriculturally. We're hardly touching it now, but we're going to see more fruit and vegetables grown. And uh, it isn't as if, you know, they could say, well, we can't grow it here now, we'll, we'll move north. It's a very limited area that you can grow these kind of crops, and we're going to run out of places to grow them in this country, and it's, that's why I, I, I would find it difficult to know how they could compensate people for this, this land. It isn't, uh, it isn't easily replaced. As far as the uh, Hatch Creek project goes now, what, uh, you know, have you been 
approached by, by say, BC Hydro and informed you on what their intentions are with the uh, rally so far? Well, not directly, we haven't been. It's, um, uh, I and mean, I'm not sure that even some of the ranchers in the area that, that's going to be directly affected are. I'm, I'm really not aware of that, but uh, it's been brought to our attention through uh, the media or word of mouth is how we, we have learned, and, and we are concerned now. We're uh, concerned the effect that it's going to have on the environment, which so you know, directly involves people in agriculture, both with livestock, which is the, the main form of agriculture in this area, plus uh, we've got several commercial alfalfa growers, and uh, from some of the information we've recently learned that this could be very detrimental to these alfalfa growers, and this, they're, uh, they're growing this hay for dairy producers in the Fraser Valley, and it's an extremely important part of agriculture. And more recently, um, we've had some uh, soft fruit and uh, vineyards that are being established on a rather large scale in the area, and I'm sure these people are going to be very concerned. What are some of the concerns of the people about the uh, Hatchery coal mine? Well, some of the concerns are, you know, there are a number of concerns, and, and uh, I can just name a couple of them, and one of them is uh, in terms of the, uh, of the river and pollution. Pollution is, is a great factor that uh, is affecting the river, and which is, you know, really, uh, a detriment to our food source, which is fishing, salmon fishing, that is a really important uh, source of food. And if something affects that, then it affects the people's uh, food supply. I noticed that there's uh, sawmills in the area, and uh, do a lot of the people work in sawmills? And yes, there. I think that's probably one of the major uh, employment areas for for the lower in the area. Uh, specifically for our area in Bridge River there, we do have a logging operation and if um, the young trees coming along uh, are affected by uh, by the uh, Hat Creek project uh, and it burns off the foliage, then, then we wouldn't have uh, this opportunity to, to develop the forest uh, resource again uh, if it really does affect it, uh, you know, negatively. The negative effects uh, far outweigh the positive effects, and especially for the people living within this within this areas, you know, within a radius of what, 50 miles in any given direction. I think it's people are really going to have to sit down and think about it. I think we would be foolish to believe that the the employment factors and things like that in the uh, is. Uh, is going to be, you know, it's going to be good for the community, whereas I, I don't, we don't think it is. But as far as the coal is concerned with respect to generating the necessary energy that Canada needs, from what I understand, Canada isn't even going to benefit from it. The, all this energy is going down to the States. So where is the benefit, you know, benefiting factors? I, you know, so I think that the people would rather see a, a steady, stable economy over a period of time that tells the whole story, and, uh, and Hat Creek just doesn't offer that. At Construction Peak, there's going to be 2,000 people brought in, and uh, what do you think the impact in the surrounding area is going to be, like Cash Creek, Cash Croft, Little Wood? Yeah. I think that uh, maybe when something uh, like this happens, like a big project like this takes place in a small area such as Cash Creek and Lowett and the surrounding communities. There's a great influx of people, so there's quick clearing of land and, uh, you know, burying of, you know, cutting the trees and what have you to clear areas for, so they can put their houses on. And there's also the factor of um, 
hunting, fishing, things like that. I think this would, you know, de deplete the deplete the overall stability of the, the way we live now. What can be left of what can be left in the area after 70 years, and what are we going to be faced with? I guess uh, when Hat when the Hat Creek project has had its way and uh, and they've disturb the area as much as projects of this type do disturb the small small communities. Uh, I think that probably when they leave, they'll probably leave a big hole in the ground and will be left just with that, a big hole in the ground, and uh, which was once at one time probably good grazing land and uh, good forestry land. Probably, you know, an overall nice place to live, and it'll be just a, a very a, a ruined, a ruined environment, and I think that the 70 years down the road after that, the people will still be suffering from this impact. Uh, has uh, BC Hydro approached you in any way? Uh, yeah, they have inter interviewed the different ranchers, and and uh, uh, on the on the start, they they haven't in in, in just in the last uh, year they haven't bothered any, but on, on the very beginning they. And, uh, well, uh, they held a few meetings in here, but uh, they actually it never accomplished much. <laughs> you, you might say they practically own the whole country. They, they do own this whole uh, north end outside of just our place in here. And uh, they've, uh, well, I imagine they've got a the largest percentage of the uh, farming land uh, west of the Thompson. How many cattle do you uh, do you have on your ranch, right? We keep 200 heads around. Just